Hey folks, welcome to the second installment of the uh, Ancient Greek Philosophy section. And uh, last time we talked about the pre-Socratics and Sophists, and we will now be talking about the Socrates and uh, his relationship to Plato. And the next lecture and final lecture on Greek philosophy, Ancient Greek philosophy, will be Aristotle. Uh, so it's no coincidence that um, Socrates was the teacher of Plato, and Plato was the teacher of Aristotle, so there's a connection there. Now with Socrates, it's a little bit harder to uh, disentangle the um, Plato's writings from his writings because Socrates didn't, sorry, I should say Socrates didn't write anything. Plato wrote dialogues with Socrates as the main character. And in fact, it's something called the Socratic problem historically, which is whether Socrates really existed or whether he existed in the minds of some of these writers. Uh, Plato wasn't the only one who wrote about him. Uh, there were some other playwrights and others who wrote about Socrates. Uh, I'm not going to get into that. That's a matter for historians. Whether Socrates existed or not, uh, we can still learn a lot from him and uh, what he had to offer as a character in Plato's dialogues. Um, so uh, I'm not, I'm not going to worry about, about that question. And uh, by the way, it's a question that applies to other historical figures too. Um, including some, some have even said Jesus, uh, but again, I'm not going to get into all, all those details. Uh, if you want to go into the Socratic problem, um, that's your prerogative. Uh, I will say that in my opinion is Socrates probably existed. I mean, we actually have other records like Roman coins later with his face on them. I would imagine that he existed, but that he was exaggerated by Plato. You know, that's probably, probably what happened. Just my opinion. Uh, but anyways, we'll be talking about his views, and even though it's hard to disentangle Socrates' views from Plato's, some have tried to do so, and there do seem to be some important differences. Uh, so we will go through some of those. But the main reason Socrates is valuable is that he was a living example of a philosopher. And in fact, he's often seen as the primary example of a Western philosopher, somebody who's critical of custom, of society, who's rational, who's reasonable, who's challenging in a positive way, who has integrity, who lives what he believes. Um, and that's actually something, by the way, that uh, a lot of current, currently living philosophers have argued that we've gotten too far away from, is living our beliefs. Uh, we've become too disconnected, some argue, in the ivory tower, as they call it, in the academic world, and we've become a little less practical, but uh, some of these early philosophers were very, very practical. Uh, as we'll see, though, Plato somewhat ironically moves away from that practicality of Socrates and focuses more on abstract ideas, uh, so we'll, we'll get there. But let's look at the ideas we'll cover in this section. So first we're going to talk about um, Socrates' perhaps most famous legacy, which is the Socratic method. Uh, you've probably heard of that before. You've certainly engaged in it, even if you didn't know what the name was, or if you didn't call it by that name. Uh, it's basically an open dialogue that's rational and reasonable, and there isn't name-calling and um, needless arguing. There are real academic arguments presented, and they're challenged. And uh, anyways, we'll talk about that. And then uh, we'll talk about Socratic ignorance. Usually we say ignorance is a bad thing, but we'll look at at least in one case when ignorance is a good thing. And then finally, the, the last of it's going to be all Plato's theory of the uh, forms. And um, just to remind you, when we talked about the pre-Socratics, we discussed relativism and I called forward. I said, remember, we're going to, when we debate Plato, um, Plato is going to challenge relativism. So it's very important, not just in this case, but in this class, to be able to remember and understand, have, to remember and have an understanding of what came before, because often there will be historical interactions. And that's kind of one of the beauties of philosophy is that you can see different historical periods, quote unquote, talking to each other uh, over time and seeing the ideas that had come before and responding to them based on their historical circumstance. Uh, so that's what's happening here. We have these sophists who are arguing that there's no truth and there's no morality. And Plato just has a strong sense and arguments and evidence, he believes, that show that that's not the case, that there is a universal truth. There is actually something that 
we can know. In other words, sometimes it's put this way, there is real knowledge. Because for the sophists, there's no real knowledge. There's just relative knowledge, right? It's just whatever the culture told you, whatever the individual's opinion is. But what Plato is suggesting is that we can get outside of ourselves, outside of our opinions, uh, in various ways to find a higher universal truth that is always the case regardless of the culture. So once again I just want to point out this is a clear tension between the idea that there are universal or objective values and truths versus the idea that there are relative or um, temporary if you will dependent truths uh, and this is what Plato primarily offers us with this theory. Now, Plato said a lot of other stuff. Uh, he wrote about politics, um, and we're not going to get too much into his political philosophy uh, because I had so intro class. I got to pick and choose, but um, the theory of forms we're going to go into depth on, and then we'll touch a little bit on Plato's idea of what a soul is. So let's move right into Socrates then. So, like I said, student of Plato um, didn't write anything down. And Xenophon was one of the other playwrights that he appears in dialogues with. Uh, and I believe Aristophanes, don't quote me on that, I can't remember the other playwright that he appears in because I'm mostly familiar with Plato. Uh, but in, 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 in some of those playwrights, it's kind of funny, they depict Socrates as kind of a, um, you know, the stereotype you think of when you think of philosophers, as somebody who's thinking so hard about the truth that he falls into a ditch because he's not paying attention to what's in front of him. So this is another one of the reasons why I think that Socrates probably existed, uh, but was more human than Plato made him seem. Because Plato makes him seem the opposite of the playwrights. Plato makes him seem like this amazing, ultra-rational, just perfect human being almost. Uh, whereas the playwrights make him seem like somebody who thought he was really deep, but actually was just an impractical, kind of clumsy dude. So he was probably somewhere in between, I would imagine. Um, now, Socrates did, though, you know, despite all those claims about his impracticality, he, he was a soldier in the war. There's evidence that he fought uh, against the Persians in, um, or I'm sorry, I, th I believe against the Spartans, actually, in the Peloponnesian War. So uh, that may have been later in life that he developed that philosophical inclination. So I already addressed that question about he, did he really exist? That's the Socratic problem. Now, let's look at the Socratic method. So it's unfortunate, you know, this is, I mentioned in my intro video that there are some weaknesses and some benefits and some negatives to an online class. This is one of the negatives, is that I have to tell you about the Socratic method. We can't engage in it. So in my face-to-face -face class, of course, I can tell you and then we can engage in it and we can look at examples. Um, the Socratic method requires a real person. You can't engage in the Socratic method by yourself or just through a video. But I can tell you what it is and you can learn how to engage with it. Uh, so more or less, the Socratic method is a dialogue, a method of dialogue where there is usually one person who is more knowledgeable, who has more expertise, and there are other people who are knowledgeable but they're sort of, you know, debating this person and they might even be challenging the person with more expertise. But that's exactly why he has more expertise, because he knows how to deal with those challenges. She knows how to handle those questions, whoever it is. But the idea, and this is very important to remember with the Socratic method, the idea of the discussion is not just to debate and be right, it's to find the truth together. So it is a mutual process. Um, and it doesn't have to be two, it could be three or four people. I mean, it could be theoretically a group of people Theoretically, it could be a classroom where it's not an individual person who's proposing ideas, but it's various students around the classroom coming up with similar ideas and contributing to the discussion. Uh, so, but again, I want to point out that the bottom line is figuring out the truth, is having a respect for the evidence and the reasons and uh, a, a failure, a, 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 a desire not to be biased a desire to be aware of and be open to being wrong, to being open-minded. Um, this is all a requirement of Socratic discussion, Socratic method. So you can probably see that this is not the sort of discussion that you get on a YouTube video or even, you know, in uh, many Senate meetings in the U.S. Senate. Uh, 
uh, Socratic method is hard to do. It takes effort. Um, and it, like I said, it takes a respect for other people in the conversation, even if you disagree with them. And it takes uh, the ability to listen and to really be vigilant over your own reasoning process. That's what it takes to truly have a conversation where you meet with someone and you hear them and you contribute openly uh, to the conversation. So that, that's the Socratic method. Now, the way uh, you can tell you're in the Socratic method sometimes is, you know, if you've ever been in conversation and you find yourself saying something like, well, no, 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 wait, 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 that's not what I meant. Wait, wait, no, 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 I meant this. That means that you appreciate that you're in a conversation where you're being listened to and you're trying to refine what you said so that the other person has a deeper understanding, right? They might say, well, wait, I thought you said socialism is this. And you say, no, 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 by socialism, this is what I mean. That's the Socratic method, is sort of refining terms and definitions and sharpening, honing, clarifying new concepts together. Uh, and Socrates was so good at this, he made people mad. Um, and it wasn't by choice, but he would often begin the conversation by asking a lot of questions. And sometimes people make the mistake of assuming that someone who asks questions doesn't know anything. Right? That's a huge misunderstanding in this world. Uh, people who ask questions are people who are probably going to be very successful, because, especially if they're listening to the answers, because that means they're guiding their life based on new information they're learning, um, rather than assuming that they know it all to begin with. So Socrates um, did that, and he would ask questions. And by the end of the conversation, and this is where the irony comes in, by the end of the conversation, he was the one who looked intellectually superior. It wasn't by design, that wasn't his point, but the other, he would often reveal the ignorance of the other person just by asking the right questions, just by really challenging their true knowledge. And the person would come out basically as a sophist, to just they thought they knew all these things, they thought they knew what justice is or truth is or whatever, and Socrates would show them that, man, you just, you didn't know much at all. Uh, and so that's the irony. Irony, by the way, is one of those terms that we often think we know the meaning to, but it's hard to put into words. It, to put it simply, it's often just when something has a double meaning, right? it seems one way and it turns out another. And that's why it's ironic with Socrates, because it seems like he's the ignorant one you know, when he asks questions, well, what do you mean by the truth or whatever? But by the end, it's clear that he was the wise one. Uh, so that's often the irony. And then um, uh, there's also the presumption in the Socratic method that we know things intuitively that has to be brought out with the right questioning. So this is where you often hear that a good teacher is somebody who knows how to ask the right questions. Um, so that's the Socratic method. Um, again, engaging in it with your friends, with others, requires patience, it requires effort, requires reason. And this is something that Socrates very much had. Now, even though we won't engage in the Socratic method proper in this class, because it's online, we will engage in, in it indirectly on the discussion boards, and um, you can engage in it yourself, so to speak, with these historical figures we're talking about. You can. Uh, see what you agree with and what you don't. So that's the Socratic method. Now related to that, the attitude that you would want to have in a dialogue where you're trying to find the truth would be one that we're, we're calling today Socratic ignorance. And again, I know that seems weird. Why, how could ignorance be good? But let, let me explain why. So this involves a story that Socrates himself tells in the dialogue of Plato Remember, Socrates is uh, written, it does not write anything down himself, but appears in dialogues that Plato wrote where Socrates is a character. So at the end of Socrates' life, he was put on trial um, for teaching about gods not recognized by the state and uh, corrupting the youth of Athens. So in other words, he was ruffling the feathers of those with the power. And that's never good. But Socrates, being the person of integrity that he was, didn't care. You know, he just, he said, this is the truth. If I'm going to teach the, the kids the truth, I'm going to teach them the truth. And so a lot of the young people loved him. But the, the people with the power hated him. 
so he got put on trial and during that time in Athens you could actually give your own defense and he ends up giving this defense and that's what the apology of that uh, the apology of Plato is is the defense that Socrates supposedly gave to the court when he was put on trial now ultimately it was voted he was voted to be put to death by the people or um, by those who could vote as we mentioned before the Athenian democracy was not for everyone um, even if it got the ball rolling on democracy so anyways he was ultimately uh, put to death and um, uh, he went, as you would imagine, very gracefully, and he was even offered asylum on another island, and uh, he refused. He said, like I said before, he, he, he said, I was born an Athenian, I'll die an Athenian, you know, he, he kept his integrity. He said, I submit to the laws of the state I was born into, even if I don't agree with them. He said, I tried to give my defense and the Athenian people didn't listen, you know, so he had that attitude, contributing to his greatness. Uh, but. Anyways, he's put on trial, and he tells this story in, that becomes the Apology. And in it, he relates uh, th this particular story about the Oracle of Athens. So let me first of all point out that the Oracle of Athens and oracles or fortune tellers back in the ancient world, back in the time of ancient Greece and Persia, they were like, I mean, they were top-notch royalty. You know, they were very well respected. And especially when Athens was kind of a cultural center during the, uh, the Golden Age, uh, people would come from all over the world, the, the, that part of the world, to see her and to ask her questions. And, you know, the sorts of questions they're asking are things like, is my son going to be successful? Is my marriage going to succeed? Are my crops going to, you know, die? Is my business venture going to go through? So questions that aren't really that dissimilar from what you might ask a fortune teller today. But back then, they had really high status. Uh, and in fact, there are some reports that, and you can see that picture there on the left, that in, in it, the, where the Oracle of Athens sat was in Mount Olympus, and you can see the picture there on the right, the ruins of where she once was. That was once a thriving temple where people would come and line up on the mountain to go see her. And the picture on the left is an artist's conception of what might have happened inside that temple. So uh, apparently there was a sulfur deposit in the mountain that they built the temple around. And that's what you see. There's sulfur coming out of the ground and the oracle sitting in the middle of it. So more or less, the oracle, the sulfur would get her high. She would basically get high. And then she'd come up with some prediction, right? She'd get high, the sulfur would go into her, her nostrils and body and permeate her, and then she'd throw out some prediction for the person who was asking. Uh, so that's the way the oracle sort of system functioned. But what Socrates tells us is he says, look, one of my friends goes to the oracle of Athens, asks her, who's the wisest man in Athens? And um, she immediately says, the oracle says, Socrates is the wisest man in Athens. Socrates does not believe this at first because he's the humble man of integrity that he is. He says, that can't be. There has to be somebody who's wiser than me. I'm not the wisest. He says, I'm just a humble dude. And so he decides, I'm going to go around to the city and try to disprove the oracle. I'm going to show her that she's wrong. Now, I'm paraphrasing a lot of this story here, so there's a lot more details that uh, if you read the story, you'll get into. But more or less, he goes around to the city, and he talks to different people who have different areas of expertise, you know, from politicians to artists to poets. And what he discovers is that although these people are wise about one particular area of study, you know, if it's a poet, they know about poetry. If it's a politician, they know about politics and so forth. Although they're wise about that, they pretend to be wise about everything else. So just because they've achieved this one knowledge of one subject area, uh, they go around talking like they know about, they know everything. So if their expertise is poetry, for instance, just because they've been told they're a good poet, they'll start talking about politics. They'll start talking about the military as though they know it when they don't. So Socrates comes to realize quickly that the reason he's the wisest is because he's the only one who knows that he doesn't know. He's the only one who is aware of his own ignorance. He's the only one who is willing to say, you know what, guys, I, I don't know that much about that. Can you teach me? 
And he's the only one who's willing to give up that ego and say, I don't know, teach me. And to be fair, sometimes, as, as I just talked about before, when he does that, he reveals the ignorance of the other person too. But the point is, is that he's the first one willing to go there, right? He's the one who's honestly saying, I, I, I don't know the answer, please tell me. And so this should be a lesson to us because the instant that you've said you know something, you've closed off inquiry, right? You've closed off an ability to think through that. And you can see that on any side of the political divide or even, you know, debates about God. You can see the atheist who there's no way in hell, pun intended, that he would ever consider believing in God, right? There's just no amount of evidence or argument that would ever convince him. His mind has been shut down to that question. And of course, there's people on the other side too, who say there's no way there isn't a God. There has to be a God. Their mind is shut down to that question. And so that's exactly what Socrates is arguing against, or not arguing, but that's exactly what this position is antithetical to, is the opposite of. Uh, to be ignorant in the Socratic way is to be open-minded. Um, not so open-minded that you let everything in. Obviously, there's some, you know, you can't listen to everyone. You can't listen to some crackpot on the street with a tinfoil hat, but you can keep your mind open enough so that you're willing to be proven wrong, you're willing to even know the conditions under which you could be proven wrong. Um, so what's interesting too with Socrates is that there were people who talked to him and they would say, man, I thought I knew something, but I talked to Socrates and I'm super disoriented. Uh, by the way, the game Assassin's Creed Odyssey does a great job of that. Um, the main character will talk to Socrates and he or she, you can choose a male or female character, they'll come away from the conversation kind of like disoriented and confused after talking to Socrates. Um, so what, what Socrates said to, in response to that, when people say, well, Socrates, you make me more confused. He said, well, the truth is I'm just infecting you, as you can see in this quote. The truth is I'm, I infect people with the perplexity I feel myself. So for Socrates, he said life is inherently this very perplexing but beautiful, wonderful thing. And there's just something, um, uh, you know, this perplexity is there for everyone. He says, it's not just me. I'm just awakening you to it. So in other words, this goes back to Socrates is bringing the knowledge out of people um, that he believes they already had to begin with. So that's Socratic ignorance. Um, Obviously, an attitude of open-mindedness is one that's easier said than done. To be truly open-minded, you have to listen to what I said at the beginning of this class. You can't use biases and fallacies. You have to be open and honest about the fallacies you're using. Right? You can't just say, oh, whoops, did I commit a fallacy and not care. You have to be interested in the truth. Um, that's what it takes to be truly open-minded. And Socrates, at least according to Plato, was certainly like that. Now, I mentioned the death of Socrates, so let me just finish off this discussion of him uh, with his, the story of his death. Like I said, he was put on trial um, for stirring things up in the city, and he, uh, like I said, he was offered asylum and turned it down and said he would die um, a citizen of Athens. And uh, in this famous painting, Socrates is, of course, at the center. And when he was ultimately sentenced to death, he was sentenced to drink uh, this ground up plant turned into liquid called hemlock, it's poison. And so he's about to drink this hemlock and that's the cup that's being handed to him, right? That's the, he's in prison, he's about to drink the hemlock. And all his friends are around him uh, and look how sad they all are that the great man is gonna die. And look how much Socrates doesn't give a shit. Right? That's the sort of character he supposedly had. He was not afraid of death. Um, he had already lived a good life. Uh, he was perfectly happy and content to die. So, um, and he's even still philosophizing, right? He's, he's about to die, and he's sitting here talking about higher dimensions or something. Uh, so that, that's the sort of incredible person that he supposedly was. Uh, and so that's it. And so he... Uh, drinks the hemlock, and actually there's, you know, there's some stories, and this is most certainly, you know, probably legend, I shouldn't say certainly, but it's probably legend, that he uh, drank the hemlock, and the way hemlock works is it seizes up your muscles, and you just become paralyzed until your heart dies and brain dies, and uh, 
some people say that when he died, it actually started paralyzing his muscles from the bottom up. You know, so from his feet upward, and he got gradually paralyzed until it reached his brain. And even before it reached his brain, he was still philosophizing. And so his brain, you know, the seat of his reason was the last to go. Like I said, probably legend, but interesting to consider. So I hope that emphasizes the, um, the integrity that this man supposedly had. And as I've said before, there have been comparisons between the Buddha, Jesus, Socrates, and many other um, great, great people of history. And Socrates is certainly worthy of some deeper study than uh, the cursory examination I've given you here. But let's look at Plato now. So I talk about Socrates and Plato together because, like I said, they're sort of a package, even though we can somewhat distinguish their views. And Plato, as I mentioned, was a student of Socrates, and believe it or not, that wasn't his name. His name was Aristocles, and uh, all this time we call him Plato because of a nickname. So he was, it, you know, it was a nickname meaning like wide or wide shoulders, and that may be because he was. Uh, um, some people speculate that he was a big dude. He was like, what, you know, not overweight but just husky and had a, a wide shoulders and so they called him that they called him wide big dude you know Plato and so I, I just find that fascinating that all this time throughout history this great philosopher we just call him by his nickname the real name was Aristocles so Plato was born into well, well let me first mention that his most famous work from which I'm taking uh a lot of what I'll teach you today is called The Republic, and this is still widely available. You can actually get podcasts of it for free, by the way, if you have a podcast app, if you just want to listen to some of the chapters. Um, chapter 7 is the one with the allegory of the cave that we'll talk about, and uh, a lot of some of the other stuff that would help ground you in this section. So if you wanted to do a little bit of your own study, either read it or put on a podcast of Chapter 7 of The Republic. Um, but if you don't do that, uh, if, if later in your academic career you go into political science, you'll certainly study Plato's Republic. Now, Plato said way too much for us to be able to get into everything here, but um, we'll focus in on a few of his core beliefs. Historically speaking, Plato was rising to prominence towards the end of the Peloponnesian War. And this would have been a very interesting time to be alive back then. So. so uh, by the way, the Peloponnesian War, um, I, I think I already mentioned this, and I'm sorry I keep mentioning Assassin's Creed Odyssey, but I'm playing it right now. It's just kind of interesting that what ends up being put in these videos that are going to be here for years is my current interest. Uh, but it's such a great game. And once again, let me remind you that you can play through this war in Assassin's Creed Odyssey. And they allow you to go to join different sides in each territory and to fight for the Spartans or to fight for the Athenians. Um, but anyways, in the real war, it was a war that was around 30 years long. It was, there was three stages that historians identify. And Athens lost in the end. And this is the famous, there are some famous battles here between Athens and Sparta that have been fictionalized. Uh, the Spartans, remember, are the sometimes said to be the fiercest warrior society that ever existed in human history. Uh, I mean, the, the men were literally sometimes killed because they were too weak, you know, so they bred these incredibly fierce warriors. Uh, they were even known to have be, you know, sort of speak like Clint Eastwood, to be just, you know, just short in their words. They didn't say too much, very stoic, as we'll talk about later. Um, we'll talk about stoicism later, I mean. So anyways, this is a very interesting time of this war between Athens and Sparta. Now when Sparta won at the end of the war, that would have destabilized a lot of all these nations around that area, uh, all these nation states. Um, and it certainly would have taken power away from Athens, both you know, spiritually, literally, and um, in, in, in spirit in the sense that they would have been weakened, their cultural center would have been weakened. Because before that was what historians refer to as the, um, the sort of golden age of Greece where a lot of the culture and art flourished and some of the, you know, the pre-Socratic philosophers rose to prominence. Uh, 
this was the end of that period. And um, so it would have been felt in Greece. There would have been a sense of loss, a sense of that our culture is declining. And this is when Plato was rising to prominence himself. So, and it, it, what was happening too is that there were these uh, 30 tyrants, sometimes called the rule by the 30, who came in and remember the, the Athenians had a democracy, at least for some part of the population, especially for the elite. Now you had the democracy supplanted or taken over by an oligarchy. And an oligarchy just means rule by a group or, you know, rule by many, it's not by many, but by, by a small group. And so this 30 people was ruling over this former democracy, Athens, and they were kind of um, very, uh, they, they just wanted to party, basically. They were just into, you know, to use modern terminology, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Uh, they didn't care about wisdom and knowledge and higher truths and things like this. Uh, they were tyrants. And so this annoyed many people in Athenian society, of course, who fancied themselves more refined um, from the Golden Age, the time of the Golden Age. And Plato, as you can imagine, was not a fan. Uh, he, he was not a fan of these tyrants. He was not a fan of people who lived their whole life based on the pursuit of pleasure and not some higher pursuit of knowledge or at least higher spiritual living like Socrates. So Plato hated that, but he also was not a fan of democracy. And he had some interesting arguments in that book, The Republic, against democracy. And one of them is that he was against democracy for the very reason that what happened to Socrates. Socrates was sentenced to death by the people. And Plato just couldn't fathom that he said they're ignorant. They don't, the people are ignorant. They, they didn't know what choice they were making. They were killing a great philosopher, somebody who had, you know, would be remembered for history. Plato probably would have even said back then. Um, so he didn't like democracy in part because people he believed are generally ignorant. And in fact, in his book, The Republic, he lays out a system uh, where he believes we should have a philosopher king. He calls him a philosopher king. And that's a leader who should not be concerned with leading, but should have gone through 30 years of training in various fields, from philosophy to math to gymnastics, to become a leader who's good at what he or she does. Uh, so anyways, um, Plato was not a fan of either. He wasn't a fan of the tyrants who came and took over Athens after the war, but he also was not a fan of the Athenian democracy either. And that's why he wrote his book, in part, The Republic, to say this is how a society should be. So Plato's Republic is actually one of the first examples of um, laying out an ideal society. Now what he ends up doing to get around these problems is he creates his own school. And uh, he builds it, and this is an artist's conception of where the school was built, in a it, it was a grove of trees called the Academy dedicated to the goddess Athena. And you can see kind of the Parthenon on the hill in the background there, um, a major staple of Greece that's still there today. But Plato builds his school here. And he decides, you know what, we're gonna, I'm gonna have a school, I'm gonna have an institute. I mean, he wouldn't have you know, called it a school or college the way we call it today, because it was the beginning of that whole kind of thing. But he says, I'm gonna have an organization, I'm gonna have a place where people can come together and without fear of reprisal, without fear of the government uh, influence or control, they can debate different ideas. But of course, the focus of the school was gonna be Plato's beliefs and his philosophy, because he's the founder. Now, in case you're wondering, yes, this is where we get the term academic or the academy. You still hear people say, you, you know, refer to the general term, the academy, and what they're referring to is the academic world. And so the academy, academics, all the words that have that root uh, it goes back to just a grove of trees that Plato built the school on. And it's another one of those fascinating things, just like his name, that throughout history the term academic uh, goes back to a school in ancient Greece several thousand years ago. So this is where Plato uh, deploys, if you will, his philosophy. And one of the core philosophies, the, the core uh, arguments that he puts forth is this allegory of the cave. 
So the allegory of the cave, you can see this picture here. I, like I said before, I'm sure some of you have heard of it. The allegory of the cave connects with his theory of form. So I want to mention up front, it's important to see for the assessment the relationship between this allegory and the theory of forms that I'm going to tell you about next. And I say that because it's easy to make your own meaning from the allegory of the cave, and that's why it's such an enduring story, because you can take multiple meanings from it. And I'm not saying you shouldn't do that, you should, but you should take your own meaning and you should understand Plato's meaning. Why was Plato creating this story? How does it fit into his greater philosophy? That's a question you should be concerned with if you want to do well in the assessment. So in the allegory of the cave, as you can see, um, again, I'm going to paraphrase this story. I, I, I put the story in full in the uh, reader so you can access it there. Like I said, you can also find copies of the Republic to get the full on chapter uh, as well. So in the story, you have these people who are prisoners and they're basically um, tied up to uh, some seats and they're staring at a wall and you can't, you can't see them too well. They're in the dark here. So if you can see the people on the left side of the rock in the image, and they're kind of sitting down on the wall facing the shadows. Okay, so those are the people just watching the wall. Now notice that the shadows they're looking at are being cast by people behind them on the other side of the rock to the right side of the rock in the picture. And they are holding these shapes in front of a fire. And the fire is casting the shadows onto the wall in front of the other people. Okay, so everyone getting that picture? And they're, of course, all in a cave, and there's an entrance slash exit uh, up on the right there. So, this is their situation. Now, here's the kicker to this story, is the people who are watching the shadows on the wall, they don't know their shadows. They believe those shadows are reality. And the reason for that is that's the only thing they've known their entire life. They've lived their whole life in this cave, staring at these shadows. But because they've never known anything else, they believe that these shadows are real. These people don't even know that there are what, are, what Plato calls puppeteers behind them holding up the, sh the shapes. They don't know there's a fire behind them. They don't know there's an exit. They don't even know that they're in a cave. This is the essence of the story. People who are sort of unknowingly ignorant of a greater, higher truth. Right, so remember that theme. Now, notice how many things we could apply this to, right? Uh, notice how many ways this connects with uh, uh, many aspects of our lives and of society. So, so for example, are we in a cave, right? In, in what way are we like these people? In what way are we born into a situation where there is a higher reality or truth that we don't even know about, and we believe that what we're staring at is actually real. And, you know, in what way are we in a cave? Well, in a few ways, right? I mean, one could refer to the government and the media, and basically we're being fed whatever the media wants to feed us. I mean, we, one could argue that we don't see the full truth of what's happening in the White House and the Pentagon and so forth, right? So we're in a cave in that way. Some people argue that we grow up in a cave in our families, um, and especially as you go through high school, you're in a cave, and it's not till you uh, graduate, quote unquote, not just in you know form, but in spirit, uh, that it's not until then that you escape your the cave of your upbringing. Um, some would argue that uh, political or religious belief systems form a sort of cave, you know, where they, you know, l let's just take. Uh, I, I'm not trying to shit on religion here, but I'm just pointing to one negative aspect that sometimes comes up, and that's dogmatism. Right? The idea that you have to believe this, you can't question it. That, unfortunately, is often told to people in very devout religious communities, uh, and people would say, well, that's, that's a form of the cave, because you're not allowing people to question. Um, but the interesting question to me comes up is, even if you escape the cave, are you, aren't you just in another cave? Right? So for example, you escape the cave of high school, now you come to college. Are you not in another sort of cave in college when you're here? And then you escape the cave of college and then you move into the cave of home life. Aren't you in another, I mean, 
does it ever end? Is there ever really a way to fully extract ourselves from the cave? I don't know. But for Plato, and like I said, we can all we can take so many meanings from the story, and we should, and that's one of the reasons it's fun. But for Plato, he was using it as a metaphor to describe uh, a higher dimension. And there's actually a part of the story I didn't tell yet, and let me add that in. And that's that in the story, one of the prisoners actually escapes. And you can see that depicted here, and that prisoner on the right side climbing up the passage outside the cave. Uh, and um, what ends up happening is the prisoner escapes somehow. We, we don't question how, but he escapes. And he gets out of the cave, and he's just absolutely taken aback. Because remember, this prisoner has lived inside that cave his entire life. Uh, has known nothing different, right? So it's the equivalent of a child, a baby infant coming out of the womb for the first time and seeing the light. So when this guy goes out into the, into the real world, he sees, you know, a real horse rather than a shadow of a horse and a real vase instead of a shadow of a vase and so forth. And at first, you know, it's kind of like when you wake up in the morning and you turn the light on real fast and your eyes aren't ready it's like that, except it's not just his eyes. It's his whole being. He is not prepared, he, and he has to take some time to just let it soak it all in. And eventually what dawns on him is the truth, which is that, wow, I've been in a cave. All the stuff I used to think was real is not real. All the stuff I used to take to be a given is not a given. And all this stuff I thought I knew, I didn't know. So you can imagine the impact of some if you really come to that realization. And um, he does. And he says, I'm in the real world now. This is actually the real world. I was in a cave before. And eventually he decides, I'm going to go back in. And I'm going to talk to my fellow prisoners. So those are the other ones on the left. And he says, they, they need to see this world. Right? By the way, I'm, like I said, I'm paraphrasing some of this. But he's basically saying, we need to see this world. We need to get out. We, we need to, I need to show them this world. I need to show them that there is a greater existence. Guess what happens when he tries to talk to them, right? They say, hey, stop bothering me. I'm busy watching the shadows, right? Or, you know, I'm busy watching Netflix. I don't want to listen to you. Uh, you know, and they basically think he's crazy that, you know, he's talking about higher truths. And they're like, shut up. The shadows are really interesting right now. You're, you're annoying me. So this is another theme in Plato, which is that people are happy in their own ignorance. Right? People, if, if you don't know that there's something better, it's really hard to jog a man or a woman out of his or her stupor. And um, that's represented here too. So going back to the, uh, the theory of forms, what Plato is saying is that the person who escapes the cave is one who metaphorically has reached a higher truth, has reached a higher level of reality. And Plato believes that people can do this in the real world. So let's get to his theory of forms now. And I've divided up um, the aspects of his theory into metaphysics and epistemology. So remember, metaphysics is about um, reality, what exists, what is, and epistemology is about knowledge, about what we can know. So Plato had different aspects of this theory, or he, he told us what he thinks exists, and he told us what he thinks we can know. So first of all, he argues that there is this eternal, unchanging world of forms that is not physical. So if you're looking for a reference point, this has sometimes been referred to as heaven, except it's not heaven in the traditional sense. This isn't a heaven where we go to, but it's like heaven in that it's immaterial, it's non-physical, and it's basically a heaven for objects in the world. It's a heaven for numbers, a heaven for math and for science, and you'll see what I mean by that in a minute. There are these, what Plato calls forms, you might think of them as eternal truths um, that are always there and always will be there. So just to take a common example, one common example would be just a mathematical equation, like 2 plus 2 equals 4. So the essence of what Plato is saying here is that if humans died, let's just say you know some uh, freak accident happens or we blow ourselves up, I guess that's not that out of the question, but let's just say the Earth is gone tomorrow, uh, 
for Plato, the world of forms would still remain. So let me say that again. Even if human life and all human thought is wiped off, the entire wiped away from the entire universe, there would still be eternal truths. That's what Plato means. That's his argument against relativism. He's saying these things always exist. They do not depend on human behavior. They do not depend on human culture. It is always the case. The two plus two equals four. He also gives the example of a triangle uh, or shapes. So, for instance, could you ever draw on this earth a perfect triangle? Just think about that for a minute. Could you ever draw a triangle that is absolutely perfectly has, you know, is perfect in the sense that it has absolutely equal sides? Well, you could use some really sophisticated devices. Um, you could even use uh, an amazing uh, graphic arts computer program to produce a triangle. But guess what? When you look down, when you print out that triangle and you look down at the lowest level of the pixels, there's going to be some differences, right? There's going to be a few more pixels on one side than another side. Because in this physical world, Plato argued, nothing is ever perfect. Nothing is ever perfect in our world. No human is perfect. No shape is perfect. No tree is perfect. Nothing is perfect. But guess what? There is a realm of perfection, says Plato, and that realm is the realm of forms. That's where perfection comes from. So the way we know things is we interact with or commune with or participate in the forms. We participate in these higher dimensions in these higher realms. So for example, we can't ever have a perfect triangle, but we can have triangles that are copies of a perfect triangle and we can get very close to perfection. We can never reach perfection, but we can get very close on this world. But that's because what we're doing is we're copying everything we do on this planet is a copy of some higher form. Now, that would imply, you know, circles and, you know, a rhombus and every other shape that there is, there's some perfect form for all of them. But for Plato, it's not just math. Math is an easy way to understand it. To, to kind of get in, but for Plato, there's also perfect forms for things like love, uh, for things like wisdom, for things like courage. There are forms for that. And Plato even said that there's an ultimate form that he called the form of the good that gives rise to all the other forms. Now, some have made the comparison here to God, although Plato certainly didn't mean it, I think, the way other concepts of, you know, many, it's certainly not in a monotheistic concept of God. Um, but that ha comparison has been made. So there's this realm of forms that we can participate in. Now, how would we participate in, say, the form of love? Well, you'd fall in love. Right? You, you could never have a perfect relationship where you have perfect love, but you could have one where you're very, very compatible with someone and you're extremely happy and you have a great connection. Um, so you can participate in the form of love. And Plato would say that if you have a relationship with someone where it's not a good relationship, you're participating in the form of love in a poor way, right? You're not, you're participating partly in the form of love, but not fully. Um, now you might be wondering, well, what about, you know, like negative forms? What about hate? Is there a form for hate? Well, Plato would, would say that not really, the, the, a form is a continuum. So love and hate would be on one dimension, one form, uh, and hate would be a really bad way of participating in the form of love. Right? It'd be a really, you'd still technically be participating in the form of love, but in a poor, poor way. Just like cowardice would be a poor way of participating in the form of courage and so forth. Um, so anyways, that's the way Plato sees the forms. Now a couple other metaphors that I think might help here. I used to work construction, so uh, I used to come up to subdivisions. A subdivision is just a group of houses that's being built um, into a neighborhood. And there, as you probably know, in many of these subdivisions, uh, residential housing units, there are houses that are the same model. Right? They have the same basic model. And um, you know, maybe every four houses you see that model again. And, you know, maybe the, there's two windows on the left and there's the garage on the right and the door in the middle. 
right? And that's one of the models. And then the other model is it's two-story and there's a room above the left garage and there's two windows on the right, right? And that's always consistent. But notice that each time a new model of the house is built, there are a lot of differences added to it. The core model is the same, right? It's still got the two windows on the left and the garage on the right. But now the paint color is different or the trim is different or the wood they use on the side porch, whatever it is, is different. So the model is the same, but it gets applied differently. So that's like the forms and the copies of the forms in our world. The form in this metaphor would be the blueprints for the model of the house. And then the way it's actually implemented, the way each individual house of that same model has its own difference, that's the copy of the model. That would be our reality. Uh, so for Plato, um, we're participating in these models or these forms or these universals. We're not universal. We're relative, but we get to participate in these things that are universal, that will always be there, even if we're taken away. Another way to think about it is, for those of you tech-savvy folks, is a uh, computer and uh, the internet, basically. So let's say that I'm trying to access a server and, you know, let's say I'm just, let's say I want to go access the Atlantic monthly. Let's just say that's a magazine, they have a website. Let's say I want to go see the Atlantic. Now, let's say I'm looking at that website on my cell phone. Now, when I turn off my cell phone, does that website go away? Absolutely not. That website is there being broadcast to anyone who wants to tap into that frequency, so to speak, to anyone who taps into that server. So I could shut my phone off and I could pick up my laptop and I could equally tap in to that Atlantic Monthly website. Or I could go get my iPad and do the same thing. Or I could grab your phone and I could do that. But the crucial thing to see is that if I turn off any of those devices, the signal from, from that server does not go away. The server does not delete just because I turn off my device. Similarly, to go back to the forms, the forms do not go away even when I stop believing in them or even when I, um, even if humans get destroyed, even if we don't exist anymore, the forms will still remain. So let me tie all this back to the sophists who argued that there is no ultimate truth. There is no higher dimension. There is no higher, it's just this world and it's all relative opinion. There's, it, it, there's no ultimate right or wrong answer. There's no ultimate truth. It's all relative. Man is the measure of all things, as the saying goes. Plato says, no, these sophists are wrong. They have opinions. So he argued, he says the sophists are correct in the sense that our, we have opinions of, the, of what Plato calls the world of appearance. So the world of appearance is the world inside the cave. Uh, it's, it's the world of the wall that the people are staring at. It's the world that most human beings live in. What we can do, says Plato, is we can tap in to a higher dimension, to a higher realm, to this higher realm of forms, and move beyond opinion. So this is a real punch in the face, metaphor, you know, so to speak, to the sophists, because Plato is basically saying, dude, you guys are so wrong. You only have opinions of this world. You don't even have real knowledge. Right? There's this real knowledge that's higher than this realm of opinion you're talking about. Again, he's talking to the sophist relativists. And Plato's saying, you don't know anything. You just have opinions. He says, but there are other people who do have real knowledge. And they're the ones who have tapped into this higher, this higher potential realm. Now the question then becomes, well, um, how do we know that there is such a realm? And obviously it has to be taken on faith to some degree, just like a world like heaven does. But Plato did have some arguments for why he thought there was a higher realm. So now again, I'm paraphrasing here and I'm using modern terminology, uh, but Plato might have said there's a certain intuition that we have. That, that suggests that we've tapped into a form. So for instance, I don't know if you guys have had the experience of solving one of those really shitty math problems, word problems. You know, one of those ones that says, if the train is going at X miles an hour at this speed, you know, that kind of thing. And you have to use like five different equations that you've learned in your math class to try to solve that problem. And those can be really intractable difficult problems to solve. And you might sit there just racking your brain for, you know, a long time. But then what happens sometimes 
you get the aha moment. The answer comes to you and you see exactly how to solve the problem. And you say, ah, I know what my teacher was talking about now. And you get the equations you need to use and you get the answer and you know it's the answer. Here's the kicker though. You know the answer without ever having to ask the teacher. Right? Because you already, according to Plato, if we use Plato's analysis, you tapped into a forum. You had an aha moment and you saw the truth. Right? You didn't need to debate with the sophist. It wasn't just your opinion versus his. You saw the truth and you knew it was the truth. So for Plato, those moments of intuition are like, you know, if I could give a visual, I'd show a lightning bolt zapping into the world of forums. Like that's the way we connect. We can't ever go visit the world of forums and open the door and walk in. But it exists for Plato in a spiritual realm that we can tap into and connect with based on a higher intuition. Um, so that's the way he kind of, that, that's the way Plato argues against relativism, against the sophists, and in favor of a universal truth, um, universal truths in general, these, these higher dimensions and higher realms of forms. Now, Plato's view, just to use the technical terminology, as you can see from this slide, is dualism. And let me just give you a little connection here with dualism. So you're a dualist. I would imagine many of you are dualists, and I say this just demographically. I'm not trying to say I know what you what you think, but if you're if you're a Christian or a Muslim, which many people in this world in this part of the world are, you're a dualist. That that religion is clearly dualist. And what I mean by that, it, it's dualist in the sense that you believe there's a spiritual realm, you know, a, a realm of like I said before, an immortal soul and that that exists in some way you don't believe it exists physically but you believe there's some spiritual higher dimension to reality but you also i would hope i would imagine you also believe in a physical world a physical reality too so dualism just means two right there's two things so if you believe in a spiritual dimension of heaven and hell or the soul and a physical dimension of this world those are two worlds that's it you're a dualist Notice how that's similar to what Plato's saying, which is that there are two worlds. There's this higher dimension of spirit. Now, unlike you, if you believe in the soul, he doesn't see it that way. He sees it as um, not so much spirit, but as an intellectual truth sort of thing. But he nevertheless believes the same thing as you if you are a dualist, because he thinks there's this one realm where there's this spiritual dimension, and then there's the physical realm. And like I said, it's the difference between the realm of forms versus the realm of appearance for Plato. So his whole metaphysical view can be seen in that way. And then we can only know the forms as through the ways that I mentioned, aha moment and whatnot, intuition, but we have opinions of the world of appearance. So anyways, that is Plato's uh, ultimate argument for um, forms and for against the sophists and for why we could have a universal truth in our world. So the last thing I'm going to tell you about Plato is his concept of soul. And by the way, Aristotle, as we'll see, is going to disagree with Plato. So if you saw some problems with Plato's philosophy, you might enjoy Aristotle uh, because Aristotle, although a student of Plato, will critique him and although he'll respect his views, he'll uh, do so, he'll differ from them respectfully. But anyways, Plato's concept of soul is basically just that we have these kind of three competing desires. And some people say that this anticipates later psychology, so especially Sigmund Freud, Freud, and, and actually a philosopher, Friedrich Nietzsche, who influenced Freud, will we'll actually study Nietzsche in this class. People around that time were starting to really, around the 18, 1900s, especially in Europe, they're starting to really think about um, what we would later refer to as the unconscious. Uh, that, there, that we have desires that, that are not directly evident to us that we nevertheless act on. Um, and so Plato, some would argue, was one of the first in the West to do this, to, to do a similar thing with less clarity perhaps, but nevertheless same idea several thousand years ago. And what Plato says is that our soul is three competing, it includes three competing pulls, three competing forces, if you will. And of course, the top force would be reason. 
And reason is everything we've talked about, the rational principle, the, you know, you don't use fallacies and biases and so forth. You look at the evidence, you, you try to be objective and open-minded and so forth. Spirit is more like will or willpower, you know, like your drive to do something. And then appetite is emotion, your, you know, your emotional desire. So Plato said it's, it's kind of like a, a horse rider. And you can see on the Greek uh, pot there that the horse rider, the dude in black on the left, is, represents reason. And the two horses represent spirit and appetite. And the idea, said Plato, is that our appetite is going to pull us in certain directions. Our spirit, our will, is going to pull us in certain directions. But we have to rein that in with reason. So if I'm hungry, it doesn't mean I just eat until I'm absolutely stuffed. It means I say, okay, uh, that's what I want. I want to eat all the cake. But my reason reminds me, but I have to limit myself because it's not good. In, in the future. So in other words, Plato's concept of soul allows for that um, competing desires and, you know, uh, it doesn't quite get into the unconscious, but it anticipates that. It says our, our mental lives are not simple. There is this complex interplay between different poles and different forces. So anyways, that uh, is a fairly basic, straightforward idea. I did want to add one other thing. Um, there have been some modifications to this theory over the years, and there's actually a psychologist named Jonathan Haidt. Uh, but anyways, he, he talks about reason as well, and he references Plato's concept of soul. And he argues that, he says, look, Plato was onto something here, but it's actually more like we're riding an elephant than we're controlling horses. So in other words, he thinks the image should be of an, a guy on an elephant. And his point is that, Emotions are way stronger than Plato thought. Our biases and our desires are pull us way harder than Plato thought. Like reason can really only tamp it down a little bit. Our emotions are basically going to pull us in another direction, whether we want them to or not. And that's what's represented by the elephant. So you know, rather than this very strong image of the horse rider controlling the horses, uh, Height's vision, the guy I mentioned just now, his vision is more of. <laughs> of a guy on an elephant like like trying to control it. So our emotion is going to go where it's going to go, according to this metaphor, but we have some control, but it's a lot less control than Plato thought. So anyways, I just wanted to give a, a modern interpretation there of Plato's view based on current evidence. Um, but I think I'm going to wrap it up there. Like I said, lots more to study on Plato if you're interested, and I'd be happy to recommend sources, and I provide many in the reader itself.